Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Vineyard. My name's Carol Ann. I'm on staff here at the church. I am so glad you guys are here and chose to spend part of your weekend with us, celebrating Jesus, celebrating what the Lord's doing in our lives. If this is your first time here, I'm especially glad you're here. I hope you have a great experience. You should have grabbed a little uh, program on your way in. Just have some information about the church, some upcoming events and things you should be aware of. But right now, we're getting ready to move into a time of worship. So it's a time to set aside to just focus on Jesus. And as I was preparing my own heart to worship with you all this weekend, um, I felt like the Lord reminded me of a moment I had earlier this week where I got a little frustrated. I was sitting in my God time, so if you're uh, new to following Jesus or new to the Bible, um, this is just a time where I sit, I read my Bible, I pray, and I try to talk to the Lord. Um, and so I was sitting in my God time er earlier this week, and I was feeling a little frustrated. Like there was just some things going on in my day that I was getting frustrated about, um, and I felt like I was kind of like pouring my heart out to the Lord in that moment. Um, and as I was sitting there, I felt like the Lord reminded me of a scripture in Jeremiah. So in Jeremiah 29, 13, it says this. This is the Lord speaking. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'm going to read that again. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And in the past, when I've read that scripture, I've kind of focused on the last part, like the all your heart part. And I felt like in this moment this week that I was doing that. I was like, God, I feel like I'm like pouring out my whole heart to you right now. But then I felt like he highlighted the first portion, which was you will seek me and find me when you seek me. And it's a very simple thing, but I was humbled in the moment to realize like I wasn't just seeking him. Like I was seeking an answer. I was seeking provision. I was seeking like affirmation, like all these other things that God can do and God can bring, but I wasn't just seeking him. And so I was convicted in that moment to repent of seeking the work of his hands before seeking him. And my response was to pray and to worship. Because when I worship, it helps me reset my gaze on Jesus. Not on the problem, not on the frustration, not on anything else that has come up in my week, but just to focus on him, because he deserves our full attention. Do you guys agree with that this morning? Like, he deserves our full attention. And so I would invite you guys to stand, and I'm going to pray that God would help us to keep our full attention on him as we worship. So would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for this group of people that are here, and they, uh, we, we just say, Lord, that we are here for you. I pray, God, that you would help us set aside any other distraction, anything we might have brought in with us that doesn't need to stay with us. We just set those things aside to focus on you alone and to seek you. I thank you that you are a God who wants to be found, and so we seek you, Jesus. I just pray that you would bless this time of worship. I pray for a blessing and favor over our worship team as they lead us. In Jesus' name, amen.
this place. Father, we're crying out. Spirit, we need you now. Glorious love surrounds us. Lord, come and fill this place. can be seated. Part of our worship time is going to include some testimonies and baptisms today. So if you're new to the church, you may or may not know this, maybe you've been around for a while, but typically the last weekend of the month we offer baptisms for people who have committed or recommitted their life to Christ. And so uh, basically, well, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Right now, I've got three folks, guys, that are going to be sharing their testimonies. And they'll come over here, to Charles and Selena and Heidi. If you guys want to come over and come up on the edge of the stage here, that would be great. Um, uh, just a little bit of introduction. Basically, testimonies are God stories. They're people sharing 
of God's activity in their life. And so it's a privilege uh, to hear a few testimonies this morning. So Charles, I guess you're first. So come on over and everybody say, here's your part. You guys be nice. <laughs> Smile. Everybody practice smiling right now because sometimes it can be a little nervous, you know, if standing a bunch of, in front of a bunch of mean looking people like you. Okay. Everybody say, hi, Charles. Ready? I'm ready. Oh. Wait, wait, let's start over. Everybody say, hi, Charles. Hi, Charles. Okay, so that's Hello. your cue. Okay, oh. go, ahead, go ahead. Got it. Uh, hi, I'm Charles. Uh, I was born into a Christian home. I grew up loving Jesus and was baptized at 12 years old. When I was 18, I slowly began to distance myself from Christ. I married an atheist at 23, and that drove me further away from Christ. I was in an abusive relationship and blamed my misfortune on God. I perceived my life to continue to grow sour, and I eventually became an atheist as well. In 2020, I began to pray, and this caused me to grow the courage to leave my abusive marriage. I filed for a divorce and obtained primary custody of my two boys in the process. During the divorce process, my mother, Tanya Lacava, uh, would watch my boys on the weekend while I worked. On Sunday, she began taking them to church here at the vineyard. Once I left the department I was in, and had weekends off work, I started attending the vineyard regularly. Since coming back to Christ, my life has been forever changed. I found kindness, love, and joy through Marlene. <clears throat> we began dating and were married last July. My family grew. I received a large family I always wanted. Career doors opened, education became easier. And finally, a lesson that I have recently learned through Jesus is to stop focusing on the next big adventure and start focusing on what's right in front of me. I was granted and taught peace. You ready, Selena? Yep. Everybody say, hi, Selena. Today I am getting rebaptized as a sign of my full surrender to an all-worthy and almighty God. I'm going to get emotional. Okay. I've been blessed to know him for most of my life. My parents raised me to trust and seek him. He's been there for me to lean on for as long as I can remember. But looking back, I can see that I've stopped myself in a lot of ways from receiving his fullness. For a long time, I followed paths that I thought were right for me without seeking God's approval. And for a long time, I let the stronghold of fear and anxiety hinder my growth and run my life when what I needed to do was run to the cross. I'm shaking. Okay. They can't see it. Yeah, they can. <laughs> okay. Somebody told me to hug you, okay, now. Okay, thank you. That probably doesn't help at all, does it? It does, it helps. Oh, okay, all right, good. If we need to, okay. I can hold that. Okay, okay, yeah, can you? I totally can. Thank you so much, okay. <laughs> Sorry, just messing with You're you. Fine. Go ahead. Okay, uh, for a few months now, the Lord has truly been transforming my life and mind. He's called me to transition basically everything in my life and posture myself in a way more pleasing to Him. I physically feel so much lighter as I learn to rest on him and take on his yoke. I'm thankful for the Lord's grace and guidance in this season, and I'm eager to example Jesus well and live for him to the best of my ability. Awesome. Great job. <laughs> Hi, Heidi. Hi. You look nervous. It was her. Oh, it was her. <laughs> Everybody say hi, hi Heidi. Heidi. <laughs> I grew up in a Christian home, a pastor's daughter, and such a daddy's girl that I believed without question that God loved me. But before hitting double digits, however, a pain and a loneliness began to grow in me that I couldn't explain, let alone know how to fill. Praying and trusting God loved me didn't seem to help. In high school, I began a five-year relationship with someone who relentlessly confirmed I was no good. My 25-year self-destructive path began there. 
Someone was finally dumb enough to marry this mess. <laughs> and our home has had so much love over our 18 plus years. But my husband and my babies and my parents and few friends who didn't give up on me have watched and suffered through so much of my chaos. Alcohol abuse, drug addiction, depression, anxiety, attempts to leave them permanently. The list goes on. We have felt, maybe John more than me, <laughs> we have felt too broken to continue many times. And the pain and the guilt of hurting my babies while trying to stop hurting myself has been indescribable. When we came to the vineyard last year, we both felt the Holy Spirit in worship. And we joined the worship team at least once a month when we played or however many times we made it to church. I didn't want to die. I could play or sing and not want to die for those moments while the Holy Spirit spent time with me. The Holy Spirit began answering questions and he showed me in safe places and with safe people where the emptiness and the hurt in me began that I didn't remember. The absolute turning point was Kevin Clark's um, talk in October, which is on YouTube if you too want to be touched. <laughs> it hit me like a dumbbell that I could take the Holy Spirit with me everywhere and that I could not want to die throughout the week too. These last three months have been an intense time of change. I'm not broken. I'm lovable. And all the things that I have been insecure about, I see as tools God gave me and to be thankful for them. I have begun being kind to myself. I am sober and all desire is gone. Life is still hard and there are messes to clean up but I have a peace and it is there for me as much as I ask. If anyone here feels like they're broken or that you too are a waste of space or if you've cried in the night on the bathroom floor for God to take you away or you are convinced that God made a mistake when he made you, I get it. I totally get it. I'm absolutely living proof that there is hope and while I don't know what took so long, I trust God's plan and I'm determined to bring beautiful from my ashes. Okay, so uh, if you're getting baptized, you can head around that way and get ready for that. I'm going to move this over here. A little bit about uh, baptism. Um, baptism is an outward and public sign, I mean, we're all going to get to watch, of something that is more important than the whole water thing. It's an outward sign of what God's been doing on the inside of a person, which is washing. And uh, even from those testimonies, uh, likely some of us are aware of how life just gets, for lack of a better term, muddied up, muddled up, messed up. And uh, so baptism is a sign that these people have decided the answer to the messed up is Jesus Christ. And so a couple things that will happen, uh, they'll come up and they'll get here into the hub with the leaders here, uh, just so you know, they will be asked three questions. So if they're up there talking, you, you'll know what's going on. The first question is something like this. Do you believe that Jesus is the savior of the world? And they'll answer the question. My guess is they'll answer it. Yes. The, the second question is, has you, have you made Jesus your personal savior? And they'll answer yes. The last question is a lordship question. And it'll be something like this. Are you going to, as best as you can, live your life, not for yourself, but for him? Are you going to switch direction and follow Christ? And they'll answer that question. And then uh, the leaders will take them and they'll baptize. They'll take them under the water and they'll baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's what's about to happen. Our job is to watch. We can celebrate. Chances are there'll be a a point where we can applaud and celebrate with them and uh, uh, be thankful to the Lord for his activity 
around here and especially in these moments, his activity in these people's lives. Let me pray and we'll get into the sacrament of baptism. Father, we need a bigger word than just thanks because the impact of your activity is huge. But we do just uh, try to express our gratitude to you for your activity in these people's lives. And we add our prayers to the so many prayers that they've probably prayed, but we add our prayers. God, would you just bless them, pour out your power, your love, uh, pour out the Holy Spirit as they walk through this sacrament, this holy moment of baptism. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'm going to interrupt. Uh, did you see little Heidi up on the screen when she said, is that her hollering back there? When she did this, did you notice when she came up out of the water and, and she went, did you, I don't know, did you see that? Was I the only one? Did she actually do that? Okay, so she did that. So I, I just about busted out in a cry on that, with that, that thing there. Uh, sit down. I, if you would be seated for a moment, that would be great. Here's the deal. Uh, some of our lives are messy. Stretch that a little bit. All of our lives are messy. But sometimes it, there's different degrees of mess. Does that make sense? Um, that's because years ago, sin entered the picture. Sin is when we're far from God, when we don't honor God. Sin can, be, can happen to us, right? There's times when our life gets messy and it wasn't really our sin that brought the mess. It was that other thing that brought the mess to us. Sometimes the mess in our life is our own fault because we're the one who, right? But it just gets messy. And so in real simple terms, becoming a Christian is acknowledging the mess of sin and then running or walking or kneeling something toward Jesus Christ, who is the answer for the mess of sin. So oftentimes in testimonies, the gospel is more clear than any other time in church. It just, I've watched that for years. So we're going to pause in case there's anyone that's sitting now that is out there thinking as the testimonies are going, your heart is aching because you're like, I want to, like that thing, that thing that's happening there in their life with this whole God stuff, like I want that to happen in my life, which is basically a confession of, I need help. <laughs> And I need this God stuff. And just to emphasize something, I think we must be living in a world where our own self-image and worth is getting torn up. I think there's a lot of people that don't understand that, you know, there's a lot of voices talking about, I know I'm no good and I don't have value and I'm a, all that stuff. And uh, the answer to that is getting to know God who has declared our value when he paid for you with the death of his own son. That's how you know the value of something. It's how much somebody will pay for it. And when he sent Jesus, Jesus declared that we are valuable to God. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? And so I'll stop rambling now because I'm probably not helping. If you need God, Jesus Christ in your life, I'm gonna invite you to stand where you are. We're gonna pray a prayer for you. Ready? Go. Anybody? Thanks. Yep. Anybody else? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, this is, you're just, you don't even have to know exactly what's going on except for, I, there's something going on in here and I want God. Anybody else? We're just gonna, we're gonna pray for you. Just a side note, most of the time when this kind of thing is happening, there are real urges to stand up and there's also a real fear of like, ah, I'm not sure I wanna do this. Uh, welcome to life. There's opposition to some of the best things that you can ever do. There's opposition. Let me just pray for a moment. In Jesus' name, I just ask for freedom in this room. Lord, if you are tapping someone on the shoulder or you are pulling on their heart, we just say in Jesus' name that they have the ability to stand. So right now, we're just asking if you should be standing for this commitment to Christ and you haven't yet, I just uh, invite you to be courageous and stand. Is there anybody else? 
All right. For those of you that are standing, okay, wonderful. For those of you that are standing, chances are for some of us, this is a recommitment to Jesus or it's what the Bible calls being born again, which is you get a new start at life. And we are all about this at the church. So following this prayer, uh, we would uh, love to just get your name and try to help you have an amazing walk with God. And so I'll have you go over here to Pastor Keith uh, while we finish with some worship. It's all right. Now, church, we're going to pray for everybody who's standing. Okay? So, okay, let's try to do this. Can we have the house lights up a little bit, or is this just, I'm just going to mess you guys up, aren't I? Ah, look at that. It's a miracle. Let's pray. Father, we pray for everybody that's standing up right now. A lot of us remember the times when you've called us to this same thing. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name that the Lord of creation, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, would come into their life and do what only He can do. Bring hope. Add value. He would say to you guys that are standing, I love you. And not only that, I like to say it this way. He looks and says, I like you. He likes you. He would die on a cross for you. There is so much power in His death on the cross for you. So we pray, Father, for new starts, fresh new life we pray that you would take them on the journey where the old the past becomes dim and goes away and new things come their way better things we pray for a closeness with you lord we thank you for jesus who is the way the truth and the life and brings it to us in jesus name we pray amen If you're standing and you're willing, would you go over here and get a card from Pastor Keith just so we can have record of this? And I know that takes courage too, but would you all stand? Everybody stand, but those of you that were standing for commitment, just go over and get a card and fill that out and give it back to him. If you would, that would be great. Let's applaud the people that just stood up and committed their life to Christ. Are we that, we're that far behind, aren't we? Wait. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing my praises to you. I will sing, I will sing. Thanks for being in church. We got more to do. Pastor Steve's going to bring a message right now. You got a quick 30 seconds. So you got a whole 30 seconds. Be nice to the people around you before you are seated. Middle schoolers, I believe, are staying in. All right? Greet each other and then we'll get on to the rest. Thanks. everyone. My name is Leah Kurtz. I'm the director of worship ministries here at the church. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us this weekend. If you are, what is happening around here? Some family stuff going on. If you are new, 
Uh, we want to welcome you. Thanks for joining us. Hopefully you have a good experience. If you have not yet filled out the Connect card that's on the seat back in front of you, please do that. That's your best first step to getting connected here at the church. So you can scan the QR code also in the back of your seat, or you can grab the actual card, fill that out, and turn that in at the Welcome Center in the atrium on your way out. If you are looking for what is next for you, whether it be your walk with Jesus or how to get more connected at the church, we're actually starting something new. It's called Next, and Next is a series of four classes where you will learn about the vineyard, what we believe, and what is next for you. And there is something unique about Next. It's not just a one-time series, but we actually plan to repeat these four classes every Sunday morning during the 950 service, not in this room, but in another room, and doing so will give you a great understanding of the vineyard, uh, your own spiritual gifts, and just some next steps on your journey with Jesus. So whether you're new here or if you want to get more involved, next is the place for you to be. Here at the Vineyard, we value loving Jesus, growing together, and giving back. And each week, if you open up your program, there are a ton of opportunities in there to do just that. But one thing I want to highlight today is the Encounter Night of Worship. So it will be an evening full of worship and following the Holy Spirit, seeing what he wants to do for everyone that comes in the midst of the room. And this time, we're going to be trying some new things. For example, Encounter will actually be on a Friday night for Friday, February 10th, and because we are in this We Are Family series, we're going to try to make things a little more family-friendly. So we're actually going to have a dedicated area, a special place for families with kids to worship. So there'll be a little more space over there. There'll be some creative things for the kids to do to engage in worship. And if you don't have kids or if you don't want to bring your kids, that's totally okay. Uh, there will be an entire section that's set up just like this, so it, you should feel right at home. Uh, but we'll ho I hope that whether you have a family or if you're just coming by yourself, that you would come and worship the Lord with us. All right, we're about ready to move into our message time. So if you keep your cell phone on, if you can make sure to turn that on silent now. And if you chose to keep a child in the service with you, that's completely fine. But if they get too restless, if you could take them out to the atrium where you can watch and listen to the message out by the fireplace. And in terms of offering, we don't pass a plate, but giving back to the Lord financially is one way that we can worship him. So we have offering boxes throughout the building, or if you would rather, you can look online at the vineyard.org slash give to find some other ways to give back. Uh, all right, with all of that, let's pray for the offering. So Lord, a lot of us in the room have decided that we want you to be the center of our lives, and the center includes our finances. So as we give back to you financially this weekend, we hope that you feel loved. We hope uh, that you feel honored and we pray for the church leadership. We pray as they have to make financial decisions that you would give them a ton of wisdom. We really want to make the best decisions regarding all of those things. So give us wisdom. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Steve Huffman. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at the church. It's good to see everybody this morning. A couple of quick things before I jump into the message uh, this morning. The first is uh, we have an exploring meeting. We're starting a new team here at the church. It's the Sanctity of Life team. So uh, if you have a passion or a desire to learn more about that team, and that team's heart is for the unborn, uh, just head to the chapel after service and there'll be a quick 15-minute exploring meeting there. Also want to let you know that on Friday night this last week, we had 160 men in this room praying and worshiping, and it was a big deal. It was a kickoff of our men's groups. Those groups actually start this week, and there is space available. And so if you're a guy in the room and you want to find other guy friends with a passion for Jesus or begin to learn about Jesus, those groups are for you, and they start this week. Just head to the Resource Center after service, and that can be helpful to you. Today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 17. Everybody say 17. Okay. Before I get there, I need to tell you a story I'm not proud about. 
This last uh, two weeks, uh, someone in my family had a routine medical test that they needed to get done. And it's one of those tests that you have to schedule, you have to take a little bit of time off work, and you have to get your health insurance to approve it. It wasn't this huge test, but it's just, that's how the process goes, right? You have to take time off work. So we figured this out. I took some time off work to, to handle it, and uh, a few days before the test was going to occur, the doctor's office called and said, hey, we've not heard back from the insurance company. And I spent the better part of 20 years in healthcare, and uh, this is not rocket science, <laughs> getting healthcare uh, insurance companies to approve te just simple tests like this. And so when I got that call, this part of my life Jesus is still working on, because uh, what makes me sometimes frustrated is when healthcare gets sort of sideways. And so within two minutes of getting that call, I called the insurance company. And I hit the customer service number, and, and the gentleman on the other end of the line picked up, and I said, hey, got this test. Seems simple. It's not approved. And he started asking very odd questions about other family members that weren't having a test. And within like 30 or 45 seconds, I knew this call wasn't going well. And so I, I stopped him after probably 90 seconds in. I, I, I said, Sir, this, this is just not going anywhere good. I'm wondering if we couldn't get a supervisor. Like, can we get, and he agreed. He's like, yep, we probably do, no problem. And so he put me on hold, and uh, two minutes later, he came back on the line and said, I actually wrote it down, he said this, I can't find a supervisor. That's what he said. And my, I don't know about you, but in the moment, it wasn't my best moment. I'm just being transparent. My, I didn't say anything, but my mind started wandering. I wanted to ask him, did you even look? But I knew that that wasn't probably, and so I finally just ended the call. I'm like, this, this is probably not gonna get resolved today, so why don't we just end the call? He agreed and we ended. Now I, I hung up the phone and I had two thoughts cross my mind. The first was I was frustrated because the, the thing wasn't resolved and we're gonna have to reschedule the test, which got taken care of, right? But I was still frustrated. And then the second thing that crossed my mind was, I didn't do very well at that call. I went from zero to frustrated pretty quick, and that's not fair. And, and it got me thinking that we're beginning, I don't know if you agree with me, but I'm beginning to see the world rush from zero to mad in about a second. Like, we're living in a time where culture is quick to cancel, yell, argue, post a hot take online, and it doesn't seem to be working. Would you agree that it's getting a little crazy? It, and I was bothered that I was participating in a way like our culture was, and I didn't like that. Now, I'm all for if there's a wrong for it to be Right. I'm all for justice. But as I was thinking about the world that we're living in today and thinking about this call that I, that I had with this gentleman, I didn't show him a lot of mercy. I didn't yell. I wasn't a big jerk, but he knew that I wasn't happy and nothing got resolved. And, and I, didn't, I didn't allow mercy. Well, here's what mercy is, just for a working definition, because we're going to build off this today. Mercy is compassion, didn't have a lot of that, or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it's within one's power to punish or harm. Not just punch, not just get, but you can, um, do you know you can emotionally harm someone? And so that's, I didn't show much compassion at that time. And just to be clear, as a follower of Jesus, as we look at that definition of mercy, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have experienced the greatest act of mercy time will ever tell. Because if we look at that definition of mercy, God has the ability to punish us. There's no doubt about it. Read the Bible. Yet when we say yes to following Jesus and we actually do that, he died on the cross for all the junk sins that I do and he looks down at me and has mercy. God is merciful. Look at this. Exodus 34 describes this. It says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's just good news. And the mercy that God shows me and you, 
we're supposed to share with other people. Jesus shares uh, at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. He shares this, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. We're supposed to be merciful. In in Luke, Jesus teaches a similar thing, and he says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. There's unquestionably a command for us to show mercy to other people. And the risk is, if we don't, is really clear. It's, look at the book of James. It says this, there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. Here's where we're headed today. As Christians, when conflict arises, We have to figure out, as a Christian family, how to do it differently. Because the way the world is doing it isn't working. And I need a better model in my life when conflict arises, and the world needs to see something different. And so before I unpack the text in Luke chapter 17, I want you to just to think, before I get there, I want you to think of a person that you've got some conflict with. Maybe you don't have conflict with anybody and you should be preaching this message. But likely most of us have some conflict with family members or maybe it's an insurance company or somebody at work or whatever it is. I want you to think about that person. We're going to use that as a framework to build off on in this message. And I want to remind us we're in this series. The series is called We Are Family, God's Sons and Daughters Doing Life Together. In this series, we're trying to figure out how as Christian brothers and sisters, we should be doing life together. We shouldn't be following what the world's doing. We should be figuring out how to do this thing better together. And I want to start as we unpack how we should do conflict differently to look at Luke 17. I don't have to give a a bunch of background of what's happening when I read this text. Jesus is teaching his disciples how to navigate conflict. So I'm going to jump right in Luke 17, just a few verses. It says, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. I love how that ends. Just a few verses. Jesus is talking about how to deal with conflict. The disciples hear about it and their response is increase our faith because they realize that's going to be hard. And so as I unpack what I'm learning in these few verses, I want to share that it's the right model to deal with conflict. Let me pray before I hit these two things I see. So Father, we thank you for your word, how clear it is, and I pray, God, as we have thought earlier about someone or a situation we had conflict in, that you would guide us, teach us this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what I see in the text. You can write this down at the back of the program. A merciful family, as a Christian family, we need to show mercy, approaches conflict differently. Duh. But I want to focus on that word differently because it has two meanings. As I unpack what Jesus says, Jesus says, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. Now, some of you are like, yeah, we get to talk about rebuking people. That's going to be a blast. Before I can go to what rebuke actually means, we cannot skip past the first part that says, if your brother or sister sins against you. Jesus is making a distinction to essentially say, you have to approach conflict differently depending on the person and if they believe in me or not. So if I'm dealing with an unbeliever or I don't know if they're a believer, I have to do conflict differently. And let's share from scripture how we're supposed to deal with that differently if it's an unbeliever. Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, this is what Jesus says. He just got done talking about evil people. And he says this, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. That's different than the world. Peter, in 1 Peter 2.12, writes it this way. He says, live such good lives among the pagans, the unbelievers, 
that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify your God on the day he visits us. Our approach to conflict with unbelievers or people who are not aware are believers should be radically different. We should be showing tons of mercy. We should be turning the cheek and allowing them to slap the other. We should be doing good deeds, which is way countercultural. And when I go back to my call with the insurance guy, I did it wrong. As I was talking to him, trying to solve my problem, I did not know if he was a Christian. And frankly, if I'm transparent, I didn't care. And I'm not proud of that. In the moment, I I was worrying way too much about my issue, and I let no room for mercy or Jesus in that conversation. You can write this in. My approach to resolving conflict should make extraordinary room for Jesus. It's a big word. My approach to resolving conflict should make extraordinary room for Jesus. If I dealt with that call differently today, because what I'm reminded about in this scripture, I would have and should have acknowledged that that guy probably is in a tough spot because just by the questions he was asking me, I knew that he didn't have the information that he needed. Maybe he didn't even have the training that he needed and it wouldn't have taken me more than a second to realize, man, this is gonna be a tough call. I'm really sorry. You're in a tough place. You're likely gonna have a number of these calls. I'm really sorry. And if I was really at the top of my game, I could have even said, can I take a second to just pray with you. Because if we do that, I don't know if he's a believer or not, but maybe I'm the only person he will encounter that will see something different than the world shows him. It reminds me of this verse in Romans 10. But how can they, unbelievers, call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And what if the someone is us? So we're to handle conflict differently with an unbeliever. Show tons of mercy. What about if someone's part of the Christian family? The text says if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. Now we get to the fun stuff. Now we can talk about rebuke, right? But maybe rebuke doesn't mean what you think it means. Here's what rebuke actually means. It means to express strong disapproval of someone, to speak seriously, warn in order to point out another's mistake, fault, or sin for the purposes of correcting behavior. The purpose of a rebuke is to not get what I want. Let let me say it differently. Telling someone they're stupid is not a rebuke. Talking about someone behind their back, telling other people all the problems this person is causing in your life, that's not a rebuke. Rebuke doesn't mean yelling at someone, minimizing, demeaning them, posting a hot take about them, punishing them, canceling them, or punching them. Rebuking is not, frankly, about you. Rebuking is about fixing the thing that caused the conflict. And if they've made a mess, getting the other person to turn from the mess and back to the ways of Jesus because you love them. Jesus shares in Revelation 3.19 why he rebukes us. Jesus still rebukes us. He says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. So the start, you can write this down, the starting point for rebuke is love. That's where it starts. So if you're frustrated with somebody, maybe they sinned against you, maybe there's conflict in the middle of it. If you're frustrated with them and you actually take a pause and you find it hard to love them, your first step is not rebuke. Your first step is to find out how to love them really well. As a Christian family, our model for rebuking has to be the model of Jesus. 
And when we do this right, we may not get the thing that we want out of it, but when we do this right, the person that has caused the conflict in our life actually does something that's important. And Jesus says this in our text. And if they repent, which is turning away from the thing that caused the conflict and turn back towards the way of Jesus, that's the thing that Jesus has a dream of in your lives and in their lives. If they repent, and it goes on, we should forgive them. It restores the relationship. So a merciful family approaches conflict differently, differently depending on if they're a believer or an unbeliever, and differently that we lead out of love instead of leading out of a hammer. That's different, isn't it? A merciful family approaches conflict differently. The second thing I see that Jesus is teaching is a merciful family demonstrates exceptional patience. You can write that in. Demonstrates exceptional patience. Jesus teaches in in verse four, he says, even if they sin against you seven times in a day, seven times come back and say, I repent, you must forgive them. Everybody say must. It doesn't say may, it doesn't say should, it says must. We must forgive them. Just think about this for a second. Some of you have, made, have done this in the past. Seven times today, somebody does something wrong, it frustrates you, but they come and say, you know what, I messed up, I repent, I'm sorry. Seven times, same thing, you have to forgive them. And here's what forgiveness means. I think it's really important for us to realize this. Forgiveness is to release the person from legal, moral obligations or consequence. Forgiveness means that they don't have to walk through the consequence that you want to give them. It means you release them from all of that. That's a lot of mercy, isn't it? Mercy, remember, mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone who is within one power to punish or harm them. That's a ton of mercy. That's what a Christian family should be doing when conflict arises. We should be forgiving people. Let me give you an example from the Bible. The book of Genesis, there's a 17-year-old named Joseph. Some of you uh, would recognize this story, but I'm gonna compress it pretty tightly. Joseph uh, has a number of brothers, 10 brothers, and he is a dreamer. He shares a dream. It makes his family mad, and his brothers... Uh, actually throw him in a pit or a cistern. Here's what a cistern looks like back in those times. It was a hole that collected rainwater. It was between 10 and 40 feet deep. So when you were thrown in, you could have drowned, broken bones. Like it was a bad deal, right? Not only did they throw Joseph, his family throws him in this pit, but they actually get him back out and sell him into slavery. Pause. That's a... That's a family argument. Like, I'm sure you guys have some junk in your family, right? But that's a dinger. 17. His family does that to him. Now, advance Joseph's life from 17. He gets sold into slavery. He eventually ends up in jail. But later on in life, when he's 42 years old, he's actually navigated life pretty well. And he now has a prominent position. He's got some wealth. And he's got resources around him. But outside of his area is a famine. And so his brothers are struggling. It's 25 years later, and his brothers who have nothing are coming to the land to figure out how they're going to survive, and they run across the brother. What does the brother do? 25 years later, my brothers throw me in a pit, they sell me to slavery, and they never find out for 25 years if I'm alive or okay. But what's Joseph's response? He forgives them. Patient forgiveness. In this verse, I love this verse, Uh, I've read it a couple of times, but never focused on the last sentence. Look at this. Then he, Joseph, threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. Benjamin embraced him, weeping, and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And look at this last. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. If you've ever been in a uh, forgiveness situation where somebody, you know, you've done something wrong, and hey, will you forgive? Yeah, I'll forgive you, you jerk. 
The relationship isn't restored, right? right? 25 years later, Joseph forgives them, and I envision this, and they were talking. They're around a tent. Hey, what's been going on over the last 25 years? Let's repair this relationship. Let's figure it out. That's exceptional patience. That's the model of forgiveness that we're supposed to have with others. To be clear, Jesus demonstrated that amount of patience with me the first 22 years of my life. I would have said I was a Christian, but was not. I was living for what I wanted, what I defined success as, and my life was a mess. Yet when I came to him when I was 22, 23 years old, he accepted me, he showed me mercy, and even today when I mess up and go back to him and say, God, I am so sorry that I did not deal with that call well with that guy, will you forgive? he forgives me. It's the same thing we should be doing with others. And as we close today, I want to make something really practical about this. How patient are we when conflict arises? How willing are we to show exceptional patience and mercy with people? Because if we don't do that, there's risk. Think about this. Think about the conflict in your lives. How quick are you? at offering forgiveness. Some of you uh, might be like Mary Poppins and you're practically perfect in every way. But I don't know about you, I, sometimes I struggle with this. And I, it reminded me of this quote from Desmond Tutu. He's an archbishop, Christian guy. You can write this down. Desmond Tutu says, without forgiveness, there is no future. When he wrote that, he was talking about nations. He's talking about this huge concept, but at the core of it, what he was getting to is your nation, city, family, friends, they will have no future if at the core of it, you cannot forgive when conflict arises. Because conflict just begets more conflict. It just grows. Look at the world today. It's just growing, conflict upon conflict. We're just reducing the amount of time that we're yelling at one another, and it is not working. And in that, there is no future. Jesus even shares in Matthew 6, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Without forgiveness, there is no future. And I think it's time as a Christian family to display exceptional patience, to show mercy that the world is not seeing, to do family and conflict radically differently. It means a merciful family approaches conflict differently and demonstrates exceptional patience. Now before I stand and close, there's a prayer at the bottom of your handout. Do you see that? I want you to think back at the person that you had conflict with. Someone who has hurt you in the past and maybe you haven't forgiven them. And as we close today, I'm actually going to pray over you this prayer. So actually, I want you to think about that person. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. For some of you, this could be really hard. At the last service, I had someone come up to me and after the last service and and tell me, that the person that they struggled to forgive was no longer here. They had passed away. But the prayer that we were about to pray was so meaningful because what they had been dragging in their life, it felt like an anchor that they couldn't move from. The hurt, the pain from it, and they'd just never forgiven that person. And so as you think about your person, I'm gonna pray this prayer over us. So Heavenly Father, we have been wronged by the person that we're thinking about. And we've held on to that debt long enough. And today we choose to release and cancel that debt. And that person no longer owes me anymore. Just as you forgave me, I forgive them. In Jesus' name. Why don't we stand? Pray to close.